Good morning. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord with you to worship. Um, I want to welcome each of you here to Mount Grove. Um, and if you're online, welcome as you join us from the internet world out there. Um, hope someday you'll be able to come join us here. I'm going to feel the spirit when you're, when you're in the building with us. Um, this is your first time here at Mountain Grove. Um, I want to encourage you to look on the back of your chair in front of you. Um, there is a visitor card. I would encourage you to fill that out and drop it into the offering plate when we pass those or leave it at guest services when you leave. We uh, would love to learn more about you um, and about our guest. Um, and I hope that you um, leave here today feeling um, loved and filled with the Spirit and will join us again soon. Also, if you have a special prayer request in that same pocket in that chair, um, there's a white card. Um, I would encourage you if you um, feel the need to fill that prayer request out and once again drop that in the offering plate or um, leave it with someone and we will definitely add your request to our prayer time here at, at Mountain Grove. Just a few announcements for today. There will be a deacons, well not a deacons meeting, but a church meeting on June the 11th at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. It will be a time where the first quarter financials are um, presented, so you'll have a chance to ask questions or get any clarification for that. Um, also, June 18th, we are having, um, on Father's Day, we're having Celebration of Wheels. Um, I would encourage you to um, join us there. I want to just take a few minutes to talk about that. Um, we've invited people um, and their wheels, whatever form it happens to be, to join us here um, at Mountain Grove. Um, they're gonna, they've been invited to join us for Sunday school and also for the church service. Um, so that's a wonderful opportunity for us to come together and, and honor our wheels and, and more importantly, up to honor um, our, our Lord and Savior who helped us create those wheels. Um, we um, want to, it's not a car show, but the, the cars will be available for you to look at after the services if you want to go out there and uh, meet and greet those people. Um, it will be a, a, a wonderful opportunity for fellowship and outreach for our church. Um, never know, some of those people who come to visit might just want to come back um, when, they, when they feel how special we are here at Mount Grove. So I hope that you'll take advantage of that opportunity. Um, you guys look in the bulletin for other announcements and opportunities for worship throughout the week. Um, now we come to the part of our service where we're going to prepare our hearts for worship. Um, let us come into the presence of God so that we may be nourished through his word. That's why we're here, to be fed. We need to be nourishing ourselves with his word. Let us worship our living God, remembering his greatness, his kindness, and his power. Um, and speaking of power, um, I I'm usually typically walk four or five miles every morning, um, sometimes on the treadmill, sometimes around town, and um, one day this week, I was walking downtown Valdez, where, where we live, and um, all of a sudden, I realized that things just didn't seem right as I was walking around the, down the street, and I realized that all the power was out. Um, there were no stoplights. There, all the, the businesses were dark. Um, there was nobody pumping gas. I mean, it was, um, it was kind of a, um, an unusual feeling, and it made me realize just how much we depend on power. Um, you know, water for some people, the power is, is important for that. And, um, of course, the stoplights, no, nobody was in the McDonald's drive through You know, I, I stopped and thought, gosh, you know, we really do depend on power. And it made me, I mean, um, immediately, um, you know, I was thinking, you know, and in, in I guess what hit me most was I'm a retired principal. So when I saw all the children out on the, the sidewalk or in the buses or standing there with their parents, I was just, thank you. Jesus, for not making me be a principal on this very particular morning, because I know how much of a headache that can truly be. Um, but it, it really, um, I guess the doxology came through my head, you know, praise God from all things. Um, you know, I, I was just praising him that, um, and, and thanking him for what he's given us. And yet, even when we don't have it, we were able to, to manage. Um, but I... I walked back around the track the last time I walked for about an hour and I came back and there all the kids were still standing there and the parents and um, I heard a mother say just as the lights came back on and they made an announcement that the kids could come to school I heard her say praise God 
And, and what entered my mind was, was she just saying that as that's a saying that she'd heard, or was she really praising God? Because that's who it was all about, and that's who we needed to praise and give thanks for, that, that the people had been able to work through that, and we had been able to, to get back in, in our life. And I, I just hope and I wish that everyone, that we depended on God's power as much as we depend on that electric power, um, you know, we need to be um, every single day praising him and thanking him for what he's given us. And, um, you know, it's times like that that you really makes you thankful that, that you have what you have. And so I'm, I'm just hoping that that lady was praising God for what he did. Um, and that's what we, we need to do. Um, so a, a verse came to mind, um, First Chronicles 29, 11, and it says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Um, I just hope that we remember as we praise his name today through song and through worship, um, what a mighty God we serve. Um, everything that exists belongs to him Everything comes from him, is sustained by him, and exists because of his sheer glory. He has the right to keep it, everything, but he chooses to share it with us. And we must praise and trust him for that and that he will provide for our needs. Um, and as we worship and praise our most precious Lord, let us rejoice for who he is. Let us celebrate not only what he has done, um, but long for what he's yet to do. If you'll pray with me, please. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day and the chance to gather together as your children to worship and to praise your holy name. We thank you for your loving kindness that, Lord, you never fail us. We thank you for being the architect of our world, if you will, and all that you have given us. But more importantly, thank you for the promise of heaven. Father, today I come to you and I ask that you lead and guide us in our thoughts and our actions so we can only bring praise and glory to your name. Please help us to trust you knowing all that you have done for us and what you will continue to do for us as your children. We are truly blessed beyond words and we owe it all to you. Lord, please help us to serve you in all we do. Help us to honor you today and every day. And help us to love others as you love us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Stand with us this morning. We're going to sing. I know you looked in your bulletin. You've noticed three old-fashioned hymns. Amen. They've stood the test of time. And uh, we don't want to get away from ever singing hymns. Uh, but, you know, we're singing this morning about heaven. One of the songs we're singing about the blood, amen, and the power. As Donna was talking about power, there, the power in the blood. We're going to sing about grace, which... Uh, if you ever get your head wrapped around this whole concept of grace, you might just get happy. Amen. And in a little bit, I'm going to sing about, about the cross. Those are topics that we need to focus on in our everyday life and never get too far away from. And um, you know all these songs. You've sung them all your life. You younger folks, you're gonna, if you never heard them, you're going to learn them this morning. Amen. And you'll be like the rest of us and take them to your grave. Uh, so sing out loud, sing with us, sing to the audience of one this morning as we do some traditional hymns. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all Shout the victory. 
While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his glory will be old. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll see and shout the victory when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory give him a shout of praise this morning amen can you get excited about going to heaven amen well let's sing about the blood there is power in the blood Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus who came? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Marvelous grace. Let's sing that. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin.
Father, as we prepare to worship you through our giving, we pray that you would bless these offerings to your kingdom. Father, thank you for your songs that we've sung this morning about the most precious topics. Thank you for each and every person here, Lord, and we just ask you to minister to us through the preaching of your word and give us a word from you, Lord, and touch our hearts that we might leave here closer walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned to you we're going to sing about the cross as well. This is a song that means a lot to my heart and spirit. The old rugged cross made the difference. Amen. was a life filled with aimless desperation, without hope walked the shell of a man, but there I had with a name. Hey. 
That's worth coming to church for, amen? Thank you, my brother. Bless my soul this morning. For the last while, I've been preaching about, well, really been preaching about restoration. <clears throat> We've been talking about Mountain Grove being in a transition. As an interim pastor, that's what I call this, is a transitional time. And, and we are being restored, Amen. I mean, God is restoring, and that's a, that's, a, that's a theme that we're going to carry out for the next few months is that restoration and renewal. But the way he's doing that restoration, the way God's doing that renewal is through you, through us. And so I want, I want you to keep that kind of in your mind down the road, that God's purpose, God wants to restore this church. His purpose is to restore this church, Amen. And the way he's wanting to do that is for us together to be a part of that. 
If we can keep those things in mind, then you're going to have the running theme over the next little while down the road. But as I was trying to see what God wanted me to preach today, today's sermon has nothing to do with that. <laughs> because preaching is as much about inspiration as it is about preparation. And so I want you to pay attention today to, to uh, uh, if this sermon is God speaking to you about what's in your heart right now, and if it's something that you need to take care of. Today, today's message is not just a salvational message. Today's message is a message to believers, and God is asking us to examine ourselves. Now, now I want you to think about that for a moment. That God Almighty, we're going to read the scripture in a moment, God Almighty wants us as believers, not as lost people, but as believers to take a look at ourselves from time to time to see if we are in the faith. He wants us to have that personal time where we look and see if we're going off to one side or to the other, if we're drifting one way. Y'all ever drifted from the faith? I'm going to preach online next Sunday. Y'all ever kind of just drifted from the faith? Sure, all of us have from time to time. And you say, well, preacher, how'd you do it? None of your business. <laughs> because you see, it's a personal thing between God and us. And from time to time, God wants us to come to a place to where we know that we're saved, and we know that we've drifted, and we need to come back. And a lot of church members that I've talked to over the years a lot of them, when you talk to them about salvation, the best they can do is to say, well, I hope I am, or I think I am, or so on, and all those kind of statements. And, and I've found over the years that many people are just not sure about their salvation, nonetheless about being able to come back when you stray from one place to another. And those people never really have peace with God. Salvation is the most important decision any of us will make. Amen and amen. We get that. We say that to kids all the time. I baptized many, many, many children, and when those kids come to the uh, come to the altar uh, and all the adults uh, gather around them, invariably you're going to hear say a, a dozen times, "You've just made the most important decision of your life." And guess what? They did. They did, because salvation is that important decision. Yet so many people lack confidence. They lack the assurance that God has given them that salvation. In our passage today, Paul is saying, look and see if you're in the faith. Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 5 through 6 is what we're going to be referring to throughout this passage. And Paul is saying, examine yourselves. Did you get that? You do the examination. Examine yourselves, he's talking to believers. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. He goes on, he says, I want you to test yourself. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? That's a strong question. Hey, do you know that Jesus is in you? Unless indeed, you maybe you're disqualified. Paul is not letting them off the hook. He's saying, if you don't know Christ is in you, maybe, you know, maybe he's not. If you're not assured of your salvation, then maybe, maybe you need to get that settled unless you indeed are disqualified. Verse 6, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. That's the whole purpose of what God's given my, put on my heart this week. I'm going to read it to you out of a couple of different translations. I like the Amplified Bible. I use it a lot. And the Amplified Bible says it this way. Just let it soak into your heart. It's, the Amplified Bible says, Test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourselves, Paul said. Don't look at me. Or do you not recognize this about yourself by an ongoing experience with Christ Jesus? Unless indeed... You're really not in the faith and have been rejected as a counterfeit. But I hope you will acknowledge that we do not fail the test, nor are we being rejected. There's a paraphrase. I don't use paraphrase a lot, but paraphrases a lot. But it's called the message, and it says this. Test yourself to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. And I think that's the reason for the occasional self-examination because we can take things for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. 
You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. And I hope the test won't show that you failed. Paul's asking all of us if we can see evidence in our own lives about our salvation. You see, salvation. Salvation is much more than just walking down an aisle and, and accepting Jesus Christ and being baptized in a baptismal pool. Don't get me wrong. All of that's a part of it. All of that's who we are. That's what we're about. We accept Christ. We show it through believers' baptism it can include all of that, but we've been, uh, uh, Brian was singing about and, and, and the songs were t uh, talking about, when we are saved, we are changed. Let me say it again. When we are saved, there's a change that takes place. And so what Paul is asking us to understand is that that change needs to be evident in our daily lives. That's why Paul is urging all of us to evaluate ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Now, I told you a couple of Sundays ago, I don't believe in a salvation by works. You get that. I mean, you know, uh, salvation is by grace. It's only through Christ that we can be saved. I understand that. But from Genesis to Revelation, from Matthew to Revelation, through the Gospels, over and over again, it is saying that we don't work for our salvation, but we do work because of our salvation. And so what Paul is leading us to is to say, are you participating in the faith? We've all gone through a lot of tests. I've had tests all of my life. I mean, I, the driver's license test, all of that stuff. I get up every morning and I do this little thing called Wordle. Can y'all do that? Yeah, don't. <laughs> the older you get, the harder it is. We, we get... We have driver's license tests. You know, we have to have, uh, if you're going into uh, uh, to be a doctor, you have all these exams. If you got all of the, a lawyer, you've got to par pass the bar. When I did my doctorate at, uh, at Southern Seminary, I had to go before all of these professors and, and I had to defend what I did and why I did what I, but nothing compares to knowing that you're saved, to taking that examination of your own self and saying, yeah, yeah, I'm there. So yeah, how do you do that? Well, you can ask a thousand questions. I've, I've sat before people all of my ministry that were doubting their salvation and tried to lead them to an understanding that Christ paid the price. And we've gone through all of that. We can go through that maybe in a series here. But today, I just want to go over three questions. Preachers always have three questions in a poem, don't they? I, I want to go over three questions that will help you. They help me. I figure I'm pretty normal. Don't talk to Debbie, but I figure I, I'm pretty normal. And so if these que three questions have helped me, maybe they will help you. The first question is this. Are you more like Jesus now than you, was, than you were at the beginning of your salvation journey? Now, 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 walk with me here. In your own eyes, I'm not talking about how your wife sees you or how your husband sees you or, or how your children see you, although those, those are important too. I'm talking about just in your own eyes when you're doing this self-examination, are you more like Jesus now than you were when you first were saved? Jesus saves us, and I want you to hear this, Jesus saves us, but he doesn't leave us the same. That means that we are, I've said it while I go, we are changed. The rugged cross made a, what's the next word? Difference. We should be personally aware. You ought to be able to look at your life. You ought to be able to look at your life and say, I am personally aware that I am not the man I was 40 years ago. I'm not the man I was 20 years ago because I think salvation, although it's an event that happens, it's also a progress that we make from time to time. We become more like Jesus as we move forward. We become more of, of what he wants us to be. We should know, we should know that we're making spiritual progress. 
from the time you're saved to now, in other words, you ought to get, if you live another 10 years, 20 years, you ought to get down the road 10 years and look back at 2023 and know from 2023 to 2043 or whatever it is that you still are making spiritual progress. You don't just get saved and sit down and, and, just, and just wait to go to heaven. God's got a reason for our salvation. If we find that our lives have not been changed, then we need to consider whether our salvational experience was real. If we find that we're missing something, that we're the same person other than we got wet one day, that we are the same people, something happened. To get to where you want to go, you got to leave from where you're at. Did y'all follow that? I say it another way. This is just a Millsology thing. If nothing changes, nothing has changed. If nothing changes, then nothing changes. The question is, do you know you're making progress? Is it noticeable even to you? I'm not asking you to spout off the exact day and time. I know some people can do that, and God bless them. I can't. I don't know that it was... Uh, 11 a.m. service on 19-whatever in Glen Gaff. I don't know that. I know that. I know I was in West Monroe Baptist Church. And long before I walked down that aisle, I knew God was dealing with my heart. Uh, back when we had, when there were pews in churches, there used to be these black marks on top of the pews, and I called those conviction marks. Because people were, they were being touched by the Holy Spirit. You see, there should be, you might not know the day and the hour, but they ought, to, they ought to at least be a recollection, an understanding that you passed from darkness into light and your life was changed. That you're moving forward in this thing called the kingdom of God. Now, having said that, salvation doesn't make us perfect. <laughs> It's kind of like a mountain climber going up a mountain, and he may slide every once in a while, but he keeps moving upward. I think that's a, the way we are. We don't, we're not perfect, but we keep moving forward in this thing called the kingdom of God. And so I'm asking you, are you making spiritual progress? Are you consistently moving forward? Are you studying God's word? Is the, is the desire to know more about God uh, do you want to know more about God than the things of the, of the world? I, I get so aggravated, the older I get, I get more aggravated at it, at trying to tell God's people to do the right thing, to come to church and to do what God wants them to do and to be participants in the kingdom of God. I said it before and I said it again. A lot of churches, a lot of Christians want you to tell them what they should do because they're not doing it, but they want somebody to tell them to do it. Did y'all follow that? There's a Greek phrase for that. It's hogwash. Because you and I, we've been changed by the power of God. We've accepted Christ as our Savior. And we want to move forward in the kingdom of God. We want to know more about God's word. We want to study God's word. We want to be living in, the, in our faith in Jesus Christ. We want to be a part of the renewal and the restoration of Mountain Grove Church. We want to be a part of that. And so I'm just simply asking you, are you moving forward? Becoming a Christian and being a Christian can't be separated you can't separate justification from sanctification. Justification is when God saved your soul. Sanctification is when he set you apart to do his will. Right now you've been set apart to be a part of the restoration of Mountain Grove Church. That's a worthy cause in 2023 to be a part of that. And you see, I want us to understand a big part of this self-evaluation is do you notice anything? What book in the Bible are you studying now? What's your prayer life like? You say, well, that, that just sounds like an old time sermon. Yeah, amen. Amen. No apologies. What's consuming your time? What kingdom are you investing in? 
all of that's a part of whether or not you're making progress or not. Are you growing, growing closer to God? Are, are you serving the kingdom God, uh, of God? I talked about that, that scripture that scripture talks about uh, uh, examining ourselves. I, I want to read just I want to read just a few scriptures. They're not going to be on the board. But I want you to hear what the Bible says about us moving forward. So I don't want you to turn to them. I just want you to soak in what it's saying about us being a progressing Christian. It might help you answer that first question, are you making progress? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creature. Listen to this part. And all things that you once were, they're passed away because you have become a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new. Matthew's gospel says it this way. It says that a good tree, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree uh, bear good fruit. Every tree, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut, cut down and cast into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know who they are. Hmm. Ephesians says this. You shouldn't be talking corruptible. No corruption should come out of your mouth, but only such as, such as is good for the building up of the kingdom of God. Psalm says, blessed is the person that doesn't make his living or doesn't uh, or doesn't group around with the ungodly. Romans says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. James says, if any of you think he's religious and you can't watch your tongue, then you need to take a look at your spirituality. James also says that we're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. You see, God doesn't save our soul and leave the rest of us untouched. We're, we're changed. We're changed. We've become new creations. That's why the Bible is clear that some are pretending to be Christian. Rome, Matthew 7, 21 says this. It says, Not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I want you to know, it, at 71 years old, I still kind of draw up a little bit when I read that verse. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of the Father which is in heaven. Again, not works salvation, but, but a salvation of works. Salvation is not when we tick off the boxes. It's not when we join the church, when we're baptized, and then we live, live like we were never changed. For too long, for far too long, lost people have used this thing of backsliding as an excuse. Let me tell you, if you're continually backsliding and you're backsliding to back to where you were and you stay there for longer than you stay here, you ought to check out whether you've accepted Christ or not. Because salvation changes us. The second question is this. Does my daily life show others the Christ I serve? <clears throat> it's a weird world we live in, amen? I mean, we're, we're in a really weird, my eyesight's so bad, I wore a different watch today, I can't see what time it is. I'll preach till I get done, okay? It, it, in this weird world that we're in, do you know, I mean, if we want Christ to see, if we want others to see Christ in us, do you know, the first time I pastored, I was at First Baptist Church, Hot Springs. On a good, that first Sunday that I was there, we had 70, 17 people. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because I got to preach to 17 people. Do you know today, a lot of people have hundreds, if not thousands, of friends on their social media site. They can make one comment, 
And some of them will reach more people with that comment than I've ever preached to in one single Sunday. And I've preached in some really large venues. I mean, you think about that. There's some people who can make one comment and reach thousands of people. Even here, some Sundays, there may be five, six hundred people that have watched this video. Don't you wish they were all in here? Amen. Y'all come on. <laughs> But, but when we talk about that second question, does my daily life show others the Christ I see, that, 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 that I say I have, does my late, I, I think some people get up in the morning and, and the first thing they think is, oh, what can I post today that's going to make half the world mad? Amen? And, 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 they, and they get up and they think, well, I know this is going to hurt some feelings. Boom. And Christ says we are known by our love. I want you to remember this. You cannot denigrate and you cannot insult people and at the same time expect them to want your Jesus. And so does our life, our daily life, and along that same line, even under our own roof. Sometimes I think it's harder under our own roof to not just let go than it is out in the world. Sometimes it's harder under our own roof when we've got those kiddos over there and we've got those grandkids coming, we've got this and that and the other. Sometimes, sometimes the true person comes out under our own roof. And I want you to don't ever forget this. It does damage to young hearts. The Bible says this in Matthew 10, 32. Whoever will confess me before men and women, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me, that is not willing to publicly show that we are his children before men, to him I will deny before my father. You see, some people want to apply that verse only to walking down an aisle and being baptized, where that is a very public proclamation, and I think we should do that. I believe Jesus also tells us that we are known by how we live daily, by our language, by our habits, by our actions, by our attitudes. Hello? Hello? by our attitudes, by how we love, and the things we talk about. Now, I'm not talking about preaching on a street corner. I never have been a street corner preacher, and God bless them if that's what they, God's called them to. But that's just not my calling. And I don't think you ought to be a holy roly for a person where you stick your bony finger in everybody's face and say, turn or burn. I don't, that's, not, that's not witnessing to me. I don't, I, don't, I don't participate in that, but I do believe, I do believe that our language lets people see or not see Jesus Christ. I think our habits and our attitudes and I think the way we live lets people see. You see, a public confession of Jesus ought to be as natural as wearing a wedding ring. Because we're the bride of Christ and people ought to know that. They ought to know that by the way we live. People say, I can't share my faith publicly, but in reality, we share who we are publicly every time we open our mouth. And so people, people know who we are. Now, you say, well, preacher, have you not messed? I messed up big time, several times. I messed up a lot, of, not a lot. I don't know if y'all know it or not, but I've got a pretty good temper Debbie's laughing. And I have to watch that. All of, I grew up on a cotton mill hill. We just slap people instead of talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to watch that. Because it doesn't show Christ. I've told you before, sometimes I think I could do more for the kingdom of God with a ball bat than a Bible. But that's not how it works. 
That's not how it works. When we ask that question, do other people see Jesus in me? <clears throat> Am I showing them Christ on a daily basis? It's not just walking down that aisle. It's not publicly just being baptized. It is every time we open our mouth, everything we say, everything we do. Third question is this. Are you at peace with God? Understand, peace with God, hang on to this, peace with God is always corrupted by known sin. Did y'all get that? And see, I'm not, I used to be a guy on West Monroe Baptist Church in Monroe, North Carolina. That's the church I grew up in. And he would pray. Every time he was asked to pray, he'd say, God, forgive me of the sins I know about and forgive me of the sins I don't know about. I'm not worried about the sins I don't know about. I'm concerned about the ones I know. And what I'm saying to you is that peace with God is always corrupted by known sin. Matter of fact, if you can sin without conviction, you're lost. That's just blunt as I can put it. Romans 12, just read it sometimes. But if you, can, if, you, if you can sin without Holy Spirit conviction, then you are lost. When I was a pastor at First Baptist Hot Springs 100 years ago, uh, my wife and I lived in Asheville, and we would drive to Hot Springs, which was a, it was a longer drive than us coming here now, but it was 45, 50 minutes, depending on the traffic. And, and we would get to this place at the bottom of the mountain, the bottom of Hot Springs Mountain, and, uh, and, and, the, and the locals say the way they paved that road is they turned a black snake loose and wherever he went, they paved. And right before, right before you got to the curvy part, there was this big barn that had in great big letters, get right with God. <laughs> and you needed to be on that road. The way, I, the way I'm preaching that this morning is this. A child of God ought to be right with God. A child of God ought to know they're saved. A child of God should be at peace with God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lets us know that. Romans 8, 16 says this. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit itself bears witness with, with us that we are the children of God. I don't know how many of you had children or grandchildren, but every once in a while, my children didn't do what they were supposed to do. You know what? They did not be, they were still my children. I still loved them. I know that that's the way God treats us. That's why the Holy Spirit's there. When we get out of the way, God sends conviction. He sends conviction in our heart. Again, if you can sin without conviction, you don't have a father in heaven, Romans 12. But, but what are Hebrews 12? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm steering you wrong. But what I'm talking about today is that if you don't have the peace of God, if God, that you are his child, then you need to get that settled. Romans also says, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so let me say it bluntly. I know that I'm saved. I know I'm a child of God. There's not a doubt in my heart. If I close my eyes here, I'm going to open my eyes in heaven. And the only reason that I know that is because of the blood of Jesus Christ with, that he shed on the cross. And when I ask him to come into my heart to be my Savior, he did, I know it, and I'm going to heaven. And that's something that we ought to own. It's not a hope so, best I can, think I am. Yes, I'm saved. And you can know it by, by, by the fact of what the Bible teaches you. People play games with this thing called salvation. They say, well, I've prayed the prayer and I've gone through the motion. I've checked the boxes, so I guess I'm saved. None of those things saved you. Not a one of them. They'll never have the assurance of God. They wonder then, and I've, and I've talked to hundreds of people, am I really saved? Did I say the right words? Have I done the right thing? Was I really sincere? Did I have enough faith? You know, I was, when I was pastoring up in the mountains, we had a, 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 one of my best friends was a, 
uh, a holiness preacher, and he was always worried about me because I didn't speak in tongues, and I was always worried about him because he carried red man in his back pocket. But <laughs> but the fact is, we loved each other, and it was good to be worried about each other. Amen. Because you see, both of us were at peace with God with where we were at. The born-again person should have a deep, underlying, listen to this word, assurance that comes from the Spirit of Almighty God that we are God's people. No other things that we've done will bring peace unless the Prince of Peace abides inside of us. So it's a pretty good thing that we do occasionally. Salvation is an ongoing relationship with Christ. I've seen so many inside the church who don't make any spiritual progress. They just kind of get baptized and flop down and that's it till they go to heaven. They don't have any outward profession. They, they don't have any inner peace. And, and I've seen so many in, later in life that would come and say, yeah, I really do want to know Christ as my Savior. And from that moment on, they would have the peace of God. Romans 5, it's not on your board. It says this. Romans 5, 1 says, We are just about justified by faith in our past. That's when we accepted Christ. We have peace in the present time through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have peace and so the song says, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We sung it this morning. There's power, power, power in the blood. Brian sung it. There's a, what a difference the cross has made in our, in our lives. When we receive Christ as our Savior, our battle with God ended and our peace with God started. And so I'm just asking you to take this test. I want you to listen to two more scriptures, not on the board, just some scriptures about peace with God. There's a dozens and dozens, but these two struck home to me this week. John 14, 27. Jesus says, peace I live with, leave with you, my peace I give to you. Now, I want you to understand, he's giving this to some di disciples that are going to go through some horrible times. So peace is not the absence of problems. Peace is the presence of Jesus. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Jesus is saying, I'm here. And the Romans verse again. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So how are you doing? <clears throat> As you look back on your life, and we ought to do this every once in a while, can you see spiritual progress? Do others see Christ in you? <clears throat> when I was pastoring, we, heard, we hired lots of associate pastors, and one of the questions I would always ask and when we were interviewed the pastor is, what book of the Bible are you studying now? What books, what are the current books you're reading? And I'll never forget this one guy. He looked up and he said, huh? And I said, are you studying God's word? What's the last books you've read? And, and he looked down. He said, I'm not, I hadn't read, I hadn't studied the Bible in a long time. That guy and I had a long conversation, not about him becoming a staff, but about what it means to want to make progress with God. At 71, we need to understand that. You say, well, preacher, what book are you reading right now? I'm sorting through Romans again right now. Thus, a lot of the references. I'm reading through that on my own because I want to make progress. So I'm asking you, what book are you reading? How are you, in, how are you using your talents for God? Because if this church is going to be restored, let me say it another way, 
when this church is restored, it will be because of us giving our time, our talent, our tithe, and being together. Have I said that before? Yeah. Giving our time, giving our talent, all of that's important. So where yet? If you know you're saved and you've never made that public, then do it. See, there's not anybody going to, <laughs> they're not going to make fun of you. They're just going to rejoice with you. If you need that blessed assurance that Jesus is yours, if you're unsure of your salvation, settle that today. You come today and follow your decision if you've never done that in believer's baptism. If you just kind of know you've been drifting, come home. Come home. I love the prodigal son story, don't you? I mean, God, God's got a line drawn with the prodigal son. And the Bible's wonderful when he says that, I can't say it without crying, when the prodigal son decided to come home, read that passage again. You know what it said? It said the father saw him afar off. He was just waiting on him. That's who we serve. A God we can be in a relationship with us. A God that understands us. I'm glad he does because a lot of us are weird. Amen? And he understands us. He loves us. And we can come home. We can come home. May we all leave here today celebrating our salvation. May we leave here today in perfect peace with our holy God. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If you need to make a choice today, this altar is open. I'm here to pray with you. I'm sure others would pray with you. If you need to make a choice today, you make that. Maybe just right where you're standing. Maybe if you're listening online, maybe you know you've not been as close to God as you want to be. Before we can have a restored church, we have to have restored lives. Father, as we sing today, may you touch our hearts. And Lord, may you use us in this thing called the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. Sing along with us and let the Lord lead. <clears throat> Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine, oh love, will you roam farther? Thank you for being here today and being a part of what God is doing in Mountain Grove. And I hope you will be back next Sunday and bring someone with you and, and just let God lead us as we continue on the road of letting God restore us and, and use us in his kingdom's work. Brian, you have anything else? Deacons meeting following this. God bless you folks. Shake hands with your neighbor. You are at liberty. <laughs>